Thank you for joining us today for our Battle Ready CE program. Here at Peer Processing, we work directly with departments just like yours every single day to help improve efficiency, workflows, and ergonomics in central sterile departments. We know that fighting bio burden to prevent surgical site infection to ensure patient and staff safety requires training. This program will get you battle ready to land a knockout punch to SSIs. The first part of this presentation will focus on reducing stress as you go into battle. We're going to focus on common stressors that affect departments where their efficiency might have felt stressed or where their efficiencies could be improved. One area of training for any professional athlete begins with training of the mind. If one isn't mentally prepared to enter a battle, stress can cause derailments and ultimately errors and losses. One way to get through this chaotic environment is through mindfulness. Mindfulness is a concerted effort to focus on the main task at hand so that it becomes second nature and outside interruptions don't distract you from your playbook. By doing so, we understand the competition, in this case, pathogens and bio burden and outside stressors. When we understand how to avoid distractions, we can focus on our playbook and the goal. Right now, departments may feel a little bottlenecked where efficiency isn't at its peak performance during reprocessing. So based on some insights we've had with our customers, we've come up with two areas where we're going to start seeing departments get stressed, soaking and ergonomics. One of the most common stressors for many departments that can become a distraction is the ability to efficiently soak robotic instruments. Robotic devices have enabled facilities to provide better health care. By providing options for us to fully focus on meeting IFU and standards and guidelines, we reduce stress and increase efficiency and quality assurance. Robotics and scopes can present challenges as they are inherently hard to soak and clean properly. A good place to start is to think about your sink basins as indispensable tools. Ask yourself, if you could give up just one basin, would you be worse off for it? If you are, then that means sink basins are a critical tool for you and your team. Sink basins are also hard to replicate. You can only do certain tasks at certain basins. To properly assess soaking issues, you must think about how you're prioritizing your basin space. If you're stressed with soaking robotics, think about how you might be able to still prioritize your sink basin space, but still be able to soak your robots for 30 minutes to meet IFU. One easy option to accomplish that task is through mobile carts. Mobile carts are a good quick fix for soaking issues and they offer a number of key benefits. If you do have a limited amount of basin space, and maybe robots don't even fit in your space, then that creates another big problem. Mobile carts can provide an option to free up that sink space. By utilizing carts, you are not using the bandwidth that your sinks require for reprocessing. The mobility factor also makes it easier to push those carts away when they're not in use. There are mobile cart options that have vertical storage. For example, if you have a small footprint, a mobile cart already might be too big. Carefully assessing your space and focusing on options may lead you to consider vertically stacked or tiered carts. They tend to have a smaller footprint. Also think about container storage, like using mobile carts where you have a lot of soaking containers. How do you store those containers? Do you have a place where you're putting them? or are they being tossed under the sink or to the side? If mobile carts are an option, the next step would be to evaluate how accessories are going to be organized at the mobile cart. If some mobile carts allow for that. Explore options that are going to allow you to mount timers, dosing pumps, enzymatic solution, right where you're actually going to be doing your soaking. What happens when you're in a situation where you actually need the capacity of a full-size sink basin? Luckily, there are options out there for single sink basins in which you can reprocess robotic instruments efficiently. The next area of consideration is ergonomics. If you're looking for a sink to implement into your department, ask yourself, is this sink going to be up to spec with the rest of my department ergonomically? How can I get more ergonomic benefits out of the sink than just height adjustability? 
Adjustability is a fantastic feature on sinks, but you can push the edge a little bit here for a winning advantage. Think about what each of your vendors are doing to consider ergonomics aside from height adjustability. When you look at sink accessories, accessories take a good sink from great to bad very quickly. I'm sure you can think of a sink that's got too much stuff on it, too much wiring. Another area to consider is how to mount the accessories. How are you going to organize your power? Being mindful about electrical is another place where a lot of things fall short. If you're going to get a new sink, ask yourself if it's going to give you the capacity you need to add more equipment in the future. Are you going to have to wait on power or does your sink include additional power outlets? When you carefully consider options, it helps make the process of choosing and purchasing a new sink much easier so that you can do your job safely and efficiently. We see a lot of challenges with ergonomics. While ergonomics sounds like a big scary word, it doesn't have to mean big project. A lot of people think if I want to improve ergonomics, I need new equipment. If you're not in a place to get new equipment right now, there are simple fixes that can have significant impact for you and your teammates and the department. And the two areas I want to focus on today are deep sink basins and anti-fatigue mats. There are several simple fixes that can have a huge impact and really improve ergonomic conditions in decontamination. When you look at these photos, is this a familiar sight? If this is your department right now, unnecessarily deep sinks are a bit of a double-edged sword, aren't they? Deep sink basins are one of the major causes of unnecessary back pain and high levels of discomfort. The bending and straining at the sink does not have to be a reality, though, moving forward. Also, look at these makeshift basins that you see in a lot of these photos. They just do not work with instruments because they were not designed to consider a number of things you need to think about when you're reprocessing instruments, such as draining solutions. These can be very hard to drain, and the bottom line is that they just don't consider the special requirements of each task. When it comes to central sterile sinks, inserts are available. Sink inserts are a fantastic option for relieving the stress of deep sinks. If you have deep sinks, you don't have to suffer. With most of the sinks in sterile processing departments today, sink inserts can be customized to simply drop into your existing sink basins. When you have one task that requires a sink insert and one that doesn't, you can easily take the insert out. Another great aspect of sink inserts are that they are very easy to clean. It can be cart washer safe and they also have, and most importantly, built-in accessories to make maintaining and working with instruments that much easier. When working with enzymatic chemistries, one needs to make sure the solution stays within temperature range and that they are diluted properly. Are you getting those features out of the built-in basins that you have now? Inserts can also be a fantastic option for separating specific instruments during reprocessing into separate basins. Think about ocular instruments which have to be separated out from your regular instruments to prevent the occurrence of TAS and other issues. Sink inserts are a fantastic option to accomplish just that. Maybe you want to have an insert that has a built-in light that will also help you enable to perform better leak testing for flexible scopes. The bottom line is that sink inserts can be very flexible and can easily address that deep sink that is very common in sterile processing departments. Another great way to address ergonomics and bodily stress is with anti-fatigue mats. There's a lot of inconsistency when it comes to anti-fatigue mats. One would think that utilizing an anti-fatigue mat would be easy. As simple as putting a tack in front of your sink and the mat then helps you and relieves pain but a lot of times that's not the case. So if you're thinking about replacing your anti-fatigue mats, I encourage you to think about a couple of things. Are they easy to clean? A lot of people prefer to have perforated mats. If you do, carefully consider how you are cleaning the mat. Are you just spraying it or are you just mopping the mats? It's really not an effective way to clean perforated mats. There are anti-fatigue mat options though that are cart washer safe and those are especially nice in decon departments. You may also want to consider standardizing your anti-fatigue mats. There are mats that are good for use in both decontam and assembly break rooms and locker rooms. 
It makes replacing and swapping your anti-fatigue mats much easier when the time comes. Also, ask yourself, can my mats serve as more than just mats? Can they be a training tool? The answer is yes, absolutely they can. Consider a workflow mat. There are mats out there now where you can have an anti-fatigue mat in front of every sink basin in your decontam. It indicates the wash, rinse, and final rinse steps and helps make it foolproof by providing reminders for people. When you have new staff, workflow mats help teach them about workflow in Central Sterile. They don't even have to think about it. Workflow mats enhance the capabilities of anti-fatigue mats in your department, and really they offer more compliance in a place where you don't have to think about it. There are a lot of quick fixes you can apply in your department now to increase ergonomics. With all of that in mind, here are some steps to focus and be more mindful of your processes. Every single day, set aside some time to seriously think through what needs to happen in your department. Evaluate some of the issues that you are dealing with because that mindful thought process does a great job of clarifying all the noise and confusion that might be surrounding those issues. If it's a big project, think about how can you break it down and how do you make improvements more bite size? Again, not every issue has to be about swapping out all of your equipment. There are applications and products in place now where you can make small improvements to easily take it step by step. Focusing your thought processes is a fantastic way to find those resolutions. Another thing to consider when bringing in any new equipment is to plan to cross-train your employees because those are utilitarian players who are a necessity to moving forward. It's going to allow your team to be much more flexible as things change over time. If we take a concerted effort to think about the situation and meditate and reflect on these potential issues that we have in our departments now or we had before, we're able to think about what's my game plan going to be over the next couple of weeks to make sure I'm in full form? What can I do now? How can I take these challenges head on? We're all excited to see the central sterile department that crosses the finish line in the end so that we can all learn from each other and improve our long game. Moving on to the next session, this session is intended to give you a brief overview of common methods of pre-cleaning and sterile processing. It will cover their benefits, disadvantages, and their impact on the effectiveness of pre-cleaning. At the end of this session, you'll be able to analyze your current procedures by asking questions, dissecting your space, and taking steps to implement improvements at your decontamination sink. So what is necessary for effective pre-cleaning? Well, essentially there are three functional elements, friction, fluidics, and contact time with detergents. Friction occurs during the brushing and flushing of lumens. Friction facilitates the separation of bioburden inside channels from its points of attachment on internal surfaces. Since brushing or flushing alone often doesn't do the whole job, the best method is a combination of both to remove hard, stuck-on bioburden. Fluidics involves a high volume of fluid under pressure. Channels require copious amounts of liquid to completely clear bioburden from long, rigid, or flexible channels. High flushing volumes also ensure that detergents and their residue are completely rinsed from inside the lumens. A specific contact time is required by every enzymatic detergent to effectively break down bioburden deposits such as blood, fat, and tissue. If your device IFU specifically requires it, an enzymatic soak for the instructed contact time followed by copious flushing makes bioburden easier to remove. It's important to allow the full contact time so that detergents can break down larger deposits. If there are active enzymes in your solution, they will break down specific soils. So remember to use the appropriate enzymatic detergents for the bioburden you are dealing with in your department. Lastly, make sure you are achieving the required solution temperature to do the job and are delivering it in the right amount of cleaning chemistry to each batch of solution. Recently, a focus group of managers and technicians were asked about their processes for pre-cleaning channeled items. 17 out of 20, or 85%, stated they had challenges with pre-cleaning their instruments. 
For a process that seems so simple and routine, why do so many technicians consider it challenging? How does the negative perception of a challenging procedure impact the effectiveness of instrument reprocessing? If we know what effective pre-cleaning is and we know the way we do it now doesn't work, how can we improve the process? First, let's discuss the most common methods of pre-cleaning. Syringes are by far the most traditional method we see in the SPD, and they are the go-to flushing method for several reasons. Anyone can learn this system. There's little if any learning curve for a new technician or nurse to apply a syringe for flushing. This makes syringes accessible to everyone. Syringes are disposable. In a use and toss department where disposability makes infection prevention easier, syringes are a good solution. And because they're available in many sizes, syringes are useful for many tasks and applications. But simplicity isn't the whole story. Syringes can cause undue strain and harm over the long run. Also, there is the issue of impeding throughput and workflow. Sterile processing technicians work hard to keep up with the never-ending demand from the OR. Syringes are the labor-intensive, inefficient ball and chain in the decontamination room, and it makes it hard to maintain a fast pace. Pulling liquid and plunging it into each instrument multiple times and repeating this dozens of times a day costs precious time. And while trays pile up, the easiest shortcut to take is at the pre-cleaning sink. In addition, flushing with syringes is notoriously inconsistent. No two techs flush the same way, and their interpretation of copious flushing is variable. Syringes are also a significant ergonomic risk in facilities. While their pull-plunge action seems simple, the force and resistance from this action varies as channel and syringe sizes vary. The strain on a technician's hands and wrists adds up over time and can present as a carpal tunnel injury risk. Pre-cleaning can be perceived as a mundane activity, which can pose another hidden risk. If technicians are not invested in the tasks they're performing, it may easy to be to forget how many times they've flushed a channel, how much volume has been flushed, and for how long, and which instruments were already flushed. Being present during the activity is important to perform it well. Productivity levels can vary among technicians due to several factors, such as how proficient and experienced is this technician? What device is being pre-cleaned? How many ports does this instrument have? What are the specific reprocessing requirements for this device? And are all the techs following the IFU completely? It's valuable to assess the flushing time required for the devices and accessories rotating through your SPD. You can analyze this in your own department by observing and timing the activity. Do your more experienced technicians flush faster than the newer ones? Which instruments seem to take the longest? Spray guns require only the pistol connected to a water source and possibly some adapter pieces to connect to various ports. Spray guns offer users reliable water pressure and quick action, which is an improvement over syringes. Reliable water pressure also makes it easier to perform continuous flushing volumes. Unlike a syringe, it's easier to flush a lumen continuously with a spray gun. While spray guns may seem to be more efficient than a syringe, they also have hidden issues. Spray guns are actually quite inefficient. They don't clean more than one channel at a time, so they only moderately increase a department's throughput. The spray gun method also requires both hands, which does not provide the option for technicians or nurses to do other tasks during flushing. A spray gun's biggest disadvantage is the risk from the aerosols it creates. Contaminated liquids become even more dangerous when they're turned into a vapor. Vapors not only coat staff members in fluids, but land on hard-to-reach surfaces. Vapors also travel farther, making their way quickly across small departments. When a spray gun is more ergonomically friendly than a syringe, the effort to keep the trigger engaged can build stress over time. Specific instrument guidelines provide insights into how pre-cleaning methods compare to each other. Spray guns, for example, are not adaptable to reprocessing tiny cannula found on ophthalmic instruments. The American Academy of Ophthalmology specifically recommends minimizing aerosolization as much as possible during pre-cleaning. If a facility is reprocessing with spray guns, 
and they reprocess ocular channels, they must find an alternative method for those devices. The third method of pre-cleaning is with automated systems. Sterile processing professionals and guidance organizations have already recognized the challenges of manual methods. The Centers for Disease Control, for example, specifically identifies the increase in productivity and efficiency and the reduction in worker exposure to dangerous liquids when using automated methods. The age-old adage, if it's not clean, it's not sterile, requires that pre-cleaning and flushing be performed as efficiently and effectively as possible to assure the cleanest instrumentation. Fortunately, there is an automated flushing solution for pre-cleaning that offers major benefits for sterile processing staff and departments. Automated flushing addresses the issue of throughput by enabling simultaneous flushing for multiple channel ports or items. One automated system will allow technicians to flush up to five items at a time, and throughput can be doubled or tripled by adding more systems at the sink. In 2011, the Amy and FDA Summit Meeting established seven clarion themes for instrument reprocessing. One theme was standardized, clear instructions with repeatable steps whenever possible. Automated flushing systems provide easily reproducible flushing cycles, which means that each technician or nurse in a facility flushes the same way every single time. Connectivity is also important, as syringes have one standard tip that doesn't necessarily adapt to all instrument ports. Available automated flushing systems adapt to virtually every lumen, allowing a tight connection and a complete flush each time. Whether flushing detergent or providing a critical water final flush, adequate fluids are necessary for effective reprocessing. Automated pre-cleaning systems can provide 1,000 milliliters or more every minute during their flush cycles, which far exceeds IFU recommendations. Automated flushing can streamline the pre-cleaning process by also enabling technicians and nurses to do other tasks during flushing. Because the system is hands-free, users can take extra time to brush complex, rotating discs on robotic arms, clean up the surrounding work area, or start prepping the next tray for reprocessing. Another important factor in pre-cleaning is the internal pressure during flushing, which should be closely monitored so as to prevent damage to delicate fiber optic bundles or thin, tiny lumens. Some automated flushing systems feature pressure relief valves to help maintain pressure inside the lumens and prevent pressure-related damage. We've compared the throughput and the time requirements of automated systems and the syringe method. An automated flushing system can flush up to three graspers at a time, which greatly increases the number of graspers that can be processed at the same sink in the same span of time. The same instrument that took up to one hour and 45 minutes to syringe flush 50 times takes around 23 minutes with an automated flushing system. To determine whether your department is running its pre-cleaning functions at optimal efficiency and volume, it will be helpful to analyze your procedures and pre-cleaning environment. Start with compliance requirements, which are often the most complex and challenging to centralize. Begin by asking your department if it has all the most current IFU for your instruments, detergents, and automated equipment. Reach out to your vendors periodically to check for revisions and updates to currently owned equipment at your location and make sure all relevant regulatory and industry guidelines are up to date, and make sure they're easily accessible to technicians and other staff. Your people are the most important resource in your department. Providing training and certification opportunities shows that you value and support them. Your staff require periodic in-servicing and education to hone and maintain their skills and to strengthen their focus on patient safety. Ensure that all staff members are properly trained on automated equipment, detergent, cleaning chemistries, and instrumentation. Observe them at work to determine if there are ergonomic challenges at the sinks. These ergonomic issues build up over time and require attention before they become more serious worker injuries. Surveying staff is the most productive way to get real-time input and feedback that can improve pre-cleaning functions and workflow. 
Conduct a department-wide survey on pre-cleaning practices. Ask your staff, do they believe there are pressing issues to tackle at the decontamination sinks? What are those concerns? Do staff feel like they lack the resources, equipment, or training to do their jobs properly? Do your methods line up with the relevant IFU? How long is it taking each technician to clean complex devices? Are all steps performed completely and consistently? The assessment should include a thorough visual inspection of hard-to-clean devices, including internal inspection of the lumens and challenging areas of the device. Visual inspection is a powerful educational tool for managers and technicians, and it can help identify poor pre-cleaning practices. A visual inspection should be conducted in the decontamination area and at the prep and pack station, since different discoveries may be made in these two areas. The assessment should also include how cleaning chemistries are used. Is the dosing consistent and is the solution at the required temperature? Are written procedures, checklists, and competency checks in place to ensure that consumables are being properly used? Document all specific concerns you find in your protocol, and then put a plan into action to address the identified issues. How can the pre-cleaning procedure or the brushes be changed to eliminate the problem? In addition to addressing specific issues, it will be valuable to ask this overall question. Are there more efficient or effective methods available that would save time, increase productivity, and decrease ergonomic strain? Managers and supervisors have numerous tools for putting continuous improvement into action. Ensure that competency checks are in place for procedures. Consider establishing certification requirements or action plans for specific staff members. Partner with your vendors to maintain updated IFU. Take advantage of local vendor fairs, which are powerful tools for networking and building support communities. Analyze, audit, and inspect regularly. Observation studies can reveal fixable issues hiding in plain sight. With these measures in place, your team will be ready, fit, and trained properly. In the third section of our Battle Ready program, we're going to go over sterile wrap protocols to help create departmental checklists based on standards and guidelines to help promote sterile packaging material integrity to ensure patient and staff safety. One of the most critical steps in reducing surgical site infections is to develop a protocol for the use and inspection of sterile wrap materials. For sterilization packaging processes to be successful and safe, three objectives must be achieved as stated by Isham. It must allow penetration of the chosen sterilant and be compatible with any other requirements of the specific sterilization process, such as drying. Maintain the sterility of the package contents until the package is opened. And create a package that can be opened aseptically without contaminating the contents by the user. Keep in mind that sterilization packaging is an FDA Class II medical device. As such, it presents a potential risk to the patient and the consequences of using a non-sterile item during a surgical procedure can be life-threatening. This is why choosing sterile packaging materials is critical, as there is no single material that applies to all needs. When choosing packaging materials, Isham guidelines recommend choosing steam sterilization packaging that is capable of withstanding temperatures of 250 to 275 degrees Fahrenheit. The Association of Surgical Technologists' Standards of Practice for Packaging Material and preparing items for sterilization standard of practice, recommends requesting samples of sterile packaging material from manufacturers prior to adoption and purchase of material. By requesting samples, healthcare facilities can test materials to ensure that the wrap meets the needs of the facility and allows the sterilizing agent to penetrate and reach all surface areas of the items to be sterilized. By testing wrap materials, Facilities can check to see if the material maintains sterility of the item up until its use, performing as a reliable barrier to microorganisms. According to Isham, ANSI Amy ST79, and AST, when choosing wrap material, it is critical to check to make sure that the package is able to be opened in an aseptic manner that allows for the sterile items to be easily removed or transferred to the sterile field without contamination. 
that it conforms to the size and shape of the items, covers contents in their entirety, provides for maximum amount of use, allows air to be completely removed during the sterilization process. The material withstands physical conditions produced by the autoclave, including moisture, pressure, and high temperatures. Materials are permeable to the sterilizing agent and moisture. The allowance of escape and removal of the sterilizing agent at the end of the sterilization process. Allows the contents to be dried after sterilization with no presence of moisture. The packaging material must also have the characteristic of being able to be dried to avoid wet packages upon removal from the sterilizer. Allow ethylene oxide gas and moisture to escape during the aeration cycle. Resist tears and punctures during sterilization and normal handling. Does not easily degrade when the sterile packages are stored. Provides a barrier to the penetration of dust and particles and resists moisture penetration. Woven fabrics should be free of lint and also free of loose fibers. Must not contain any toxic material or dyes that could produce a chemical reaction during the sterilization process. Reusable packaging should be free of bleaches and detergents that could produce a chemical reaction during the sterilization process. Toxic residues can be harmful to the patient and members of the surgical team who are handling the packaged materials and sterile team members who are handling the contents and can also cause instrument discoloration. Packaging must promote the integrity of the seal that is used to secure items so that content sterility is maintained. The seal should not spontaneously open when the package is in sterile storage. Materials should be incapable of being resealed once the seal is broken or the package is opened. Materials should be cost effective for the facility. Turning to woven packaging, materials are available in 100 thread count muslin, which is a cotton calico and barrier type cloth. It is typically made of 100% unbleached loosely woven cotton fibers and made of two ply fabric fastened together as one wrap. Other woven fabrics in sterilization are duck cloth, twill, and treated barrier fabrics. Disposable packaging materials are examples of engineered fabrics. There are three types of disposable packaging materials, paper, polyolefin plastic, and disposable non-woven wraps. Craft type papers are smooth surfaced, available in various sizes, and are porous or soft good items. Craft type paper is also available in medical grade pouches to hold small parts and instruments. Craft type papers are also available as flat wraps. Paper plastic and spun bond polyolefin plastic combinations are also commonly used and often referred to as peel pouches. Spun bound melt blown spun bond flat wraps are also widely used. They are constructed by polyolefin layers exposed to high heat and are then pressure bonded together to form sheets. These are designed as single use disposable products and come in a variety of sizes as a single or double sheet wrap that is then bonded together. When evaluating packaging material or a packaging system, the healthcare facility should request and review the manufacturer's information to ensure it is appropriate for the method of sterilization to be used and to review and maintain a written copy of the sterilization validation studies. AST standards of packaging also recommends when using reusable packaging materials that materials should be laundered, inspected, and properly stored between every use to preserve the packaging properties of the material. Single-use packaging materials should be properly stored to preserve the packaging properties of the material. Additionally, all woven packaging materials should be delinted prior to use. All woven packaging materials should also be inspected for holes, tears, and thinning of the material each time after laundering. It is recommended the inspection take place with the use of a lighted table. Defects should be repaired with the use of a vulcanized patch that is heat sealed onto the woven material. A patch should be placed on each side of the defect. Defects should not be sewn. The needle from sewing creates multiple holes in the woven material, producing multiple routes of microbial entry to the sterile field. 
multiple laundering and defect repairs eventually caused the woven materials product's failure to meet the criteria for performance and must be retired. The healthcare facility should have a tracking system in place such as marking grids or barcode systems to track the number of times a woven product is laundered and sterilized. Check the manufacturer of the woven product's written recommendations for the number of times the product can be processed and used. AST's standard of practice states that all wrapped packages should be prepared to facilitate ease of opening the package and transferring to the sterile field while maintaining the sterility of the contents. To do so, facilities must use the correct size wrapper in order to ensure complete coverage of the contents and sterilization. The wrapper should not be too large in order to prevent the air pockets from forming. This can inhibit the penetration and release of the sterilant. However, it should not be too small as to not allow adequate coverage of the contents and possibly tear at the corners. Wrappers that will be used to establish a sterile field should be large enough to extend a minimum of six inches below the four sides of the table or basin ring. Wrappers must be large enough to cover the hand of the individual opening it. If the package is to be handed to the central sterile technician in the scrub roll, using sterile technique or transferred to a sterile field. Before wrapping an instrument tray, an absorbent lint-free linen towel should be placed between the bottom of the tray and wrapper to cushion the corners of the tray and prevent tearing, as well as serve to absorb the condensation during steam sterilization. Density is a key factor related to the sterilization of items. The more densely items are packed, the greater the percentage that the sterilant will not contact the surface areas of all items, and drying will be inadequate. Amy has recommended that instrument sets should not exceed 25 pounds. Additionally, ANSI Amy ST79 also recommends that woven and non-woven wraps should be FDA cleared as medical sterilization packaging systems for use in healthcare facilities. They should be stored and maintained according to the manufacturer's written IFU and selected according to the size, shape, and weight of the medical device to be processed. Items should be wrapped securely to prevent gaps in the wrap material, and items should not be wrapped too tightly because tears and punctures could occur. Once packaging materials have been chosen and implemented within a facility, the preparation of items for sterilization begins after decontamination. When choosing and using non-woven wrap, sterile processing personnel should choose the grade of sterilization wrap according to the size, shape, and weight of the medical devices to be wrapped, the guidelines within the healthcare facility, and the wrap manufacturer's written IFU. They must inspect the wrap to ensure that it is free of defects that could have an adverse effect on the performance of the material, and confirm that the wrap is free of non-fast dyes and is designed to minimize the generation and shedding of fibers or particulates or lint during normal use. Check disposable wraps for manufacturer expiration dates prior to use to avoid a reduction in the packaging's ability to perform at optimal standards. When inspecting woven and non-woven wraps, it is recommended by ISHM that inspection is conducted to ensure that there are no tears, punctures, worn spots, or stains from previous use. Then inspection is performed using a light table that has a light source built into the tabletop to help spot small holes and punctures. As the wrap is passed over the lighted tabletop, light shines through the small holes and punctures, making them easier to identify. Additionally, Isham recommends maintaining proper lighting in the assembly area, as the work being performed is very detailed and inadequate lighting can lead to errors and strain. By utilizing a tabletop light as well as magnifying task lights, ergonomic ease on the central sterile technician is achieved by limiting strain on eyesight as well as physical strain through the use of a tabletop workspace. By easing strain on the technician, productivity and quality assurance is enhanced. By carefully selecting the proper sterilization packaging materials, patient safety is enhanced, packaging compromises reduced, and cost savings are implemented. In addition to selecting the correct packaging materials, Utilizing tools to inspect materials to ensure integrity of the material and the instruments being sterilized is paramount to successful sterilization and is a winning combination. 
The final section that we want to talk about in our Battle Ready CE series involves project and renovation planning. The sterile processing department is also known as the red zone. Is your SPD getting red zone planning attention? When planning projects and renovations, you need to have a game plan that incorporates products that protect your staff and your medical device inventory, meet regulatory guidance, ergonomics, and helps providers achieve productive, consistent, compliant, comfortable cleaning processes that support optimal clinical outcomes for their patients. In this little diagram, you will see there are three core parts. There's actually a few more parts of the sterile processing department, but simplifying the sterile and clean parts are the most visible and where they get the most attention and where outcomes and productivity are considered to be a little bit more important most of the time than the red zone, which is the dirty area. Recently, a hospital shared with us that they were really struggling to get the outcomes and the productivity in their department because of bottlenecks. They also had regulatory issues and staff issues. What became painfully obvious while going over their game plan is that over the course of the last 20 years, both the clean areas and those in sterile had gotten larger to accommodate that larger surgical volume. In fact, they've had three generations of washers and two generations of sterilizers during that same period of time. However, the decontamination room was the same as it was 20 years ago, both the same footprint, same flow, same equipment, same amount of equipment. What became obvious was that the dirty area is vital to speedy outcomes. If you're unfamiliar with a dirty area, it's sometimes referred to as the red zone. It's where all the gross bio-burden product comes back in from the patient care areas, and instruments are soaked, flushed, sorted, rinsed, and cleaned. It's an extremely labor-intensive area. Additionally, there's a significant amount of staff exposure in this area just based on the bio-burden and the volume of instrumentation and devices that are coming down to the dirty area. So what is the red zone? What is this area and why does it matter? If it's not clean, it's gross, it's dirty. You can't sterilize bio-burden. Cleaning is a process from a regulatory perspective that's necessary for sterilization and reduction of infections. We understand that in the red zone, in this update, we want to aspire to 100% sterile and 100% on time. Those are always the goals in sterile processing. It's well known that the dirty side impacts all areas of speed, and speed impacts all patient care environments. Decisions oftentimes are made by choosing quantity over quality. Managers are told we've got a production schedule, we've got surgeries, we've got to get this stuff moving through. As a result, some of the quality goes to the wayside when you haven't done the pre-planning to properly outfit yourself for this department. When plans are not in place, people are impacted. They become overwhelmed, they take sick leave, and it becomes hard to replace an aging population. Many technicians have been doing this for 15 to 20 years, and when they leave, they will nearly be impossible to replace their capability, their skill level, and their passion for what they're doing. The dirty zone is critical to clean and sterile when it comes to outcomes around people, around processes, and around productivity. When we don't do the planning and we aren't mindful of the importance of the red zone, we end up getting bottlenecks. More surgical volume is going to continue to grow on a more regular basis, and the devices have become so much more complex. What used to be two to three pieces in the past now breaks down to six pieces. We've just doubled your volume in what you have to process and get through your department with, of course, less resources. And unfortunately, departments are being asked to do more with less staff. So we have to keep our team in tip-top shape. We have to avoid losses from injuries, lost working hours, workers' comp claims, and more. Does your team have to work around what they are given in order to be semi-productive? Or do you have a department built for productivity, safety, and compliance? A big part of the game plan is using products that leave you feeling confident that you are compliant when you open a new department or buy a new piece of equipment. And that will carry into the future. Know that the product that is going to stay compliant because it was built and designed accordingly. To create a winning strategy, you must begin to think about and plan for success, or what we'll call dirty planning. If you put in the work and planning to secure your space and your equipment, you'll be closer to your 100% sterile goal. Here's an obvious example of no game plan. 
You've got a bottleneck in the first department. It's not going to be able to speed through your clean and sterile areas and then distribution. It just doesn't work that way. And oftentimes, staff has to make sure the equipment's working for them and not a wreck they have to work around. By understanding scalable productivity, staff impact regulation, compliant products, and then regulation compliant processes, you can better see and prepare for the processing workflows. Consider how many people are each station. How are they going to flow as the instruments flow through the department? How could we be optimal if we change things and turn the department just a little bit better for a better workflow assessment? This is where space and architectural drawings are vitally important. If spatial assessments don't make it into the architectural drawings, then that additional space that you're fighting for, it doesn't exist. It needs to be part of the game plan or architectural drawings. Once you get the space, you've got to fight for the space because it's an easy place to give up on that space and the rest of your departments will then get more of it. It starts with the red zone space to make sure you can avoid bottlenecks. You will need to customize equipment to fit your space, whether it's new renovation or replacement equipment built to fit your space. And make sure you customize your equipment for optimal productivity, ergonomic safety elements, and optimal staff safety. Renovations and upgrades don't have to be difficult. If you look at a reprocessing sink, you can probably count up all the things that have power to it. And there may be upwards of 12 outlets but you need only one outlet for that sink. The power cords have been placed underneath the sink and the cords are channeled instead of normally being in the middle of your workspace. As a result, it doesn't require a big electrical job if you're trying to bring in a new sink in the current space. Plumbing and plumbing codes across the US are very difficult to make these plumbing issues work. And a lot of facilities do it according to plumbing codes and make it functional. There are now telescoping drains and drains assemblies available that are built into the bottom of sinks. Because of that, all your plumbing team must do is cut into one side of it or in the middle of it and run it out to your floor drain and or your wall drain. This makes it more affordable to do something without the major cost of construction. Staff safety and ergonomics are incredibly critical. Most of the time in our healthcare environment, we talk about ergonomics on reprocessing equipment. Most departments simply want to upgrade to height adjustable options. While that's great and meets compliance, ergonomics is so much more. Backwall pegboards are great for organization, but with an attached pegboard, accessories move up and down with the units. So they're always moving up and down with the five foot two employee or the six foot two employee. As a result, they always stay ergonomically efficient between that waist and shoulder height. The bottom shelf also raises and lowers with the equipment as well, making the shelf reachable if you lift your sink. And just a simple, subtle wrist rest as opposed to that 90 degree pinch point that your hands and arms and forearms are hanging over all day is an injury and pain reducer. This allows your hands to enter smoothly and easily into the sink and take away that pinch point. Flushing pumps on the far left corner help to reduce musculoskeletal disorders. If you are no longer plunging syringes all day or spraying instruments with water guns. And at the end of the day, your instruments receive the right amount of fluid run through them per the manufacturer's recommendations. So when you hear ergonomics, create a game plan to go on the offense to tackle pain and injuries. So to circle back to the question, is your red zone getting red zone planning attention? If not, take a moment to create a game plan or take a time out. Stop, pause, and assess if you need more space, more equipment, need better workflow for your staff to avoid bottlenecks. By giving attention to the red zone, you can greatly increase the department workflows, QC, and on time will improve. When your department space is in play, when you get the proper flow, the right space for your staff and the right equipment, there's less of a trade-off of quality for quantity decisions and people are impacted. This is a winning combination because this becomes much more safe, more productive, and morale goes up because at the end of the day, you've given your staff the tools and the space that they need in a better, safer environment to actually meet the goals that are required of them. When creating a game plan, plan equally the clean area, the sterile area, and the dirty area because it has a holistic impact on your people, your overall performance, and your quality control processes. 
Now that you've completed the four-part training session to become battle-ready against SSIs, we're confident you're going to be able to deliver the knockout punch. Please see and download our assessment guides and checklist to complete the Battle Ready program. When finished, please submit your request for your CE certificate. Thanks and keep up the great work.